We are meeting Li Chuan, a former fashion executive with Gucci, in her apartment in London. Li Chuan adores cats. Many years ago, she decided to dedicate her life to saving the South China tiger, respectively to bring it back into the wild, where it had gone extinct. Against all odds, she managed to get the support of the Chinese government, and she's now trying to do what no one has ever achieved before, and most experts deemed impossible only a few years ago, rewilding the tiger. Since I was a child, I was fascinated by them. Um, then, you know, I found the animals particularly beautiful, tigers and leopards and domestic cats. So because of the fascination, I was always interested in, you know, knowing more about them. You know, I had books uh, on them, on the cats, and trying to learn the behavior. So throughout the years, even when I was in business, in fashion business, I was always um, keen on, you know, their... Um, the knowledge about the cats. The tiger has been in Chinese culture for seven, eight thousand years. So it was revered and feared at the same time. Like, you know, we revere the gods in the West, and we probably also fear the gods' punishment. It's a kind of similar relationship between the Chinese and the tigers. The ancient Chinese recognized they key flag role, the flagship role of the tiger then. So if the tiger's gone, the habitat is gone, the ecosystem is gone, the forest will be gone, and that's what happened. I was very naive because I came from business background. I had no idea what uh, the charity sector was like. And when I started the charity, um, you know, the project, it was during the internet boom. I thought, who wouldn't want to save the most endangered tiger in the world? I could just collect some money online and on the internet and, you know, start a project. But in reality, it was not that easy. Uh, in reality, uh, you know, for, for, you know, conservation is a very expensive undertaking. Um, if you really didn't have the credibility, corporations will not donate to you, and that's a problem I faced. And um, um, for example, one of my sponsors that transported the tigers uh, from China to South Africa, years later I learned the kind of attacks they received for sponsoring the project. And because other organizations simply didn't like what I was doing, in fact, other organizations, even those organizations now, saying it's a great idea, let's all do it. Then, back then, they were extremely critical. Not just critical, they even attacked you know, what I was doing, even attacked me personally. So there's been a huge shift uh, in their attitudes towards the, the model that I proposed even though they were still not like me. This because, you know, I was not trained in conservation and then well, why would allow a lay person to, to take all the credibility? But at least now I'm, I, I'm truly happy for the tigers or wildlife because if we look at this alternative model, we may have a chance to save them. Because in the wild, all population of tigers have been declining. So unless we put down, you know, our personal ego stuff, Concentrate on what the tiger need, we cannot save the tiger. Like Cambodia, even though you know, there's still forest, but there's no tigers. It's depleted. And same thing in Vietnam, same thing in Burma. So in order to bring the tigers back, we have to probably take you know, either uh, animals from zoos or translocate them from other areas in order to save them. Otherwise, the tigers are doomed. The tigers. Uh, has been actually wiped out all throughout the tiger range uh, areas, namely Asia. 90% of the tiger population is gone. 90% of the tiger habitat is gone. You know, it's completely wiped out in, for example, in many areas of Cambodia, Vietnam, and therefore the only way to bring the tiger back is to rewild and reintroduce them. I, uh, I was under a lot of criticism, sometimes even personal attacks, for trying this unorthodox 
untraditional, uh, unproven method of rewilding tigers. And, you know, uh, people would just say, you know, scientists would say, just not possible. You know, there, there are mainly two arguments. And uh, one argument is the tiger, uh, once in captivity, can never learn to hunt. The tiger cubs would practice, you know, by playing um, with game, the tiger would learn to hunt through chase. And one of the particular things, you know, anyone who had cats would notice, you throw a ball, the cat would go instinctively after the ball. And the cat's actually intrigued by anything that moves. And that's so crucial in the cat's hunting exercise or learning experience because once the cat starts chasing, that's their chase re reflex kicking in, they will go and catch whatever, whether it's a ball or a rabbit or, you know, an antelope. Once you catch the game, the cub initially wouldn't know that's actually their food. They will play with it. Then accidentally, they kill it. But even the kill it, they wouldn't know that was actually their food until the mother actually show the food. And this principle really was applied to my rewilding project and it worked. It worked wonderfully. So people are starting regarding the rewilding and introduction as actually an alternative to big cat conservation. Well, traditionally they thought, well, you know, wildlife, you have to you know, you can't fence the wildlife in because you're going to stop them from wandering around and you confining them. But the truth is, because they were not confined, they would come into conflict with humans. And it was very clear to me, but it was not very clear to many, you know, people in the field. And they, I think a lot of people in conservation had this rosy picture of pristine area of wildlife, where there's no human presence, you no know, human, you know, uh, objects, everything. It's like David Attenborough movie. That's my impression before I went to Africa. I thought, wow, you know, I like to find places like that, where there's not a trace of human beings, just me and animals. But I know that was not reality. I wish there were, but I would be deluding myself. Um, so having seen that uh, over 10 years ago, I, I actually saw, well, South Africa had a valid model. This is probably might be the only model to protect wildlife. You either fence the humans in or you fence the animals in, either way. And, um, and now, you know, I'm very, very pleased that the so-called controversial model that I ad advocated is also becoming accepted. So both rewilding and fencing are being accepted by the mainstream. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm really glad for the sake of saving wildlife. The name of the Sultan tiger is actually misleading uh, it, because, the, because the first Sultan tiger was seen by a Westerner, an Englishman, in the southern part of China. By then, the Sultan tigers basically have been wiped out in the north and you know they started retreating to the more mountainous areas in the south and eventually retreating to deep mountains. Um, therefore, you know, it was given the name the South China Tiger. But actually the South China Tiger was also found in the northern part of China before. It was, you know, it went as north as Beijing, you know, where I was born and as west as Shanxi uh, province. So it, it occupied a large area, and that's why it's also called the Chinese tiger. And uh, however, because it was very flat in you know, the northern part of uh, China, and therefore we humans, like you know, many animals, we prefer, anyone who have a choice, we prefer actually the, the flat areas. And the tiger being a predator, of course, he needs to follow the game. And there's certainly more game for the tigers to hunt in a flattish area than in the mountains where the goats cannot even stand unless you know, you're adopted to that, to that particular habitat. So, but once that easy area was taken by human beings, 
and there were no more game. And the tiger had to retreat as well. And they didn't, you know, they tried to avoid human beings as well, and they retreated. And slowly, the tiger retreated to the southern part of China. Because in the southern part of China, it's more likely to find areas that are fewer human beings. And so now we're looking at habitat in the southern part of China.